October 16, 2000, Tallahassee, Florida. A duck hunter goes to Lake Seminole, but never returns. For years it's thought he may have been eaten by alligators, but 17 years later, his body would be found an hour's drive away. Tonight on True Crime Island is the murder of Jerry Michael Williams. Hi, I'm your host Cambo. Grab a beer and pull up a deck chair. This is True Crime Island, another true crime podcast. Islanders, well, thank you all for your patience over the last week or so. While I was in Thailand, I'm back in Sydney, ready to get stuck into some true crime cases for you. Now, there was a big reaction to last week's episode on the romance scams, and thanks so much to the listener that wrote about their saga. So, there may be more. This week is a case that I saw on YouTube last week as I was going through some true crime of course, on YouTube, I wasn't looking for the case. It just came on as the next up video. And it gave me the rage so much, I thought it would bring it to you this week. In fact, you may know about it because it's just had a recent update. So let's get a bit of background on the main characters. First up, there's Jerry Michael Williams, or Mike Williams as he liked to be called, born in Bradfordville, northern Leon County in Florida on the 16th of October 1969, the son of a bus driver and a daycare worker. He was pretty good at school, becoming student council president. He played footy and was an active member of the Key Club, which, for those that don't know, because it might not be everywhere, it's a student-led organisation whose goal it is to encourage leadership through serving others. That's lovely. At around 15, he started duck hunting, and it's around this time that he would meet the love of his life, Denise Merrill. Denise was a cheerleader at school, and her and Mike hit it off well. They looked the perfect couple. They became close friends with another couple, Brian Winchester and Kathy Thomas, in fact, Mike and Kathy had been together for a little while when they were younger, apparently. They all went to school together and would go on double dates to the movies, dinner and all that sort of crap. <laughs> Eventually, they all got married to their respective partners in 19, 1994. Now, Mike was quite successful at his job as a property appraiser after finishing studies in political science and urban planning. He got a job at Ketchum Reality Group and would become great friends with the owner, Clay Ketchum, who described Mike as the hardest working man he ever knew. Someone that would go home for dinner and return to the office to do more work. Also, Mike loved duck hunting and often during the season he would go out hunting in the morning before work. In 1999, Mike and Denise had a baby and Denise became a stay-at-home mum as Mike was doing so well at his job. According to his mother, Cheryl, he was bringing in around $200,000 a year, so that's pretty good money, especially 20 years ago. Mike and Denise bought a really nice house in the wealthy part of town. So here's Mike, Mike, very successful, nice house, married to his childhood sweet-ass Denise, starting a family with plenty of money coming in. Paradise. Hmm. Brian and Kathy were doing okay as well, but Brian was an insurance salesman and bringing in nowhere near the money that Mike was. However, the couples hung out together and Mike and Brian became best friends. Now, although Mike had a very good income, he and Denise had agreed on limits that they could spend on credit cards so that they would always be financially well off. Any large purchases would have to be discussed and decided upon. What? That's a 
Fucking great idea, isn't it? Mike took out a modest life insurance policy on himself now that he had a baby. And Denise was a stay-at-home mum, as I said, to protect them in case anything happened to him. So, you know, she wasn't working. If something happened to Mike, all that money's going to stop coming in. He's got the family. No drama. In 2000, Mike's father died. And this led to Mike taking out a second life insurance policy. Now, he took this out through his best buddy, Brian, for about a million dollars or so, maybe a million and a half. This was to be paid the premium in quarterly installments. Now, Mike, being the obsessive worker that he was, often was out of the house, leaving Denise with the baby. The reality was, Brian, his best mate, was rooting his missus. Yes, Denise and Brian were having it off on the side whenever they got the chance. Brian's wife, Kathy, would comment later that she suspected Brian of having an affair after she said he was going on a hunting trip, but police called her telling her they found his car in a vacant lot near Denise's house. What's a car doing there? What's it doing there, Brian? You're supposed to be duck hunting. Ah. Oh. This affair had been going on for some time, so Denise and Brian start talking about where it's going and what they can do. Now, Mike must have suspected something was up. I don't think he suspected Brian of doing anything, but he did decide to cancel the $1 million or so dollar life insurance policy. Once, of course, the payment was due, he didn't want to pay it again. In September 2000, Mike confided in his boss, Clay Ketchum, that Denise had been making purchases through the credit card larger than the limit they'd agreed upon. Now, I don't know what the limit is or was, maybe a few hundred bucks or a thousand, I don't know. But Mike told Clay that he felt his trust had been betrayed. That feeling of betrayal that Mike had was justified and maybe he didn't tell his boss everything that he suspected. The reality was the life insurance policy that Mike wanted cancelled Denise and Brian made sure another quarterly payment was made to extend it. Now, this may have been the payment that that Mike had told his boss about. Look, I'm pretty sure it was, but I'm not 100% sure. Denise and Brian had been talking about how to be together for a while. Denise did not want a divorce for several reasons. She was a full-on Christian and divorce looked bad. She would also come out of a divorce without the house and maybe without her daughter. Definitely, she would be worse off financially and at least shared custody. Mike had to go, and with the $1 million or so life insurance policy, it was best that he was dead. Denise wanted to be a rich widow, not a poor divorcee. They discussed several ways on how to kill Mike. Denise didn't want him shot at the house or at his office, and she didn't want to be the one to do it either. They even planned that they both, both married couples would go on a boat trip to the Gulf of Mexico well, they would throw not only Mike, but Kathy, Brian's wife, overboard as well. Brian didn't like the idea of killing the mother of his kids. Eventually, they decided that Brian would go out duck hunting with Mike and make sure he didn't come back. The plan was to make it look like a drowning. Brian would go with Mike, but not let anyone else know he was going. He would get Mike to wear waders on the boat, go out in the deep water push him over the edge where the water would fill up the waders and Mike would drown. Brian would then race back to meet his father-in-law who he'd organised to meet and go hunting with uh, later in the day and this would establish an alibi. Oh, and get this. Brian would drug his wife so she wouldn't wake up in the morning and notice him missing. So he's going to race back home, jump back in the bed and go, oh, darling, eh, I've got to go out shooting with my dad now. She'd just go, oh, okay, whatever. So Mike would be reported missing by Denise, who would say he went off alone duck hunting. His body would be recovered and that would be that. Hello, insurance money. Easy, eh? Then what could go wrong? Now, there were time constraints on Mike being killed. First, if they were to do it during duck season... Like duck shooting was only allowed on certain days for a limited time of the year. Also, the life insurance policy that Denise had extended without Mike knowing would run out soon. 
Another factor was that Mike was getting frustrated that Denise wasn't having sex with him and he was planning on moving out of the house and was suspicious that she was either doing drugs or something else. Also, their anniversary was coming up and Mike planned to go away with Denise to try and reignite their marriage. Denise obviously didn't want to go. So, if they were to do this, it had to be soon, within the next few weeks. The duck hunting trip was organised for the 9th of December 2000. However, this would be cancelled. Mike called Brian the night before from his office and told him he couldn't go because Denise had asked him not to go. What? Brian was, what the fuck? And as soon as he got off the phone with Mike, he called Denise to find out what she was thinking. Did she want this to happen or not? He told her if she wanted this to happen, they were running out of time and for her to ruin the plan that night before was not a good idea. She had to be sure, as once Mike was dead, there's no going back. Eventually, Brian and Denise met up and decided that they would go ahead with the plan and not back out. They said if it was God's plan for this to happen, that it would happen as there was a chance Mike would survive being pushed into the water. Now, that's that's some truly fucked up religious thinking, isn't it? Anyway, on the early hours of the 16th of December 2000, Mike had organised to go duck hunting, taking his boat to Lake Seminole. This lake is on the Florida-Georgia state line and has three main rivers, Spring, Chattahoochee and the Flint River flowing into it and it forms a lake as it is dammed off at the Jim Woodruff Lock Dam, which flows onwards to form the Appalachicola River. I hope I got that right. I'm sure someone's going to tell me. Anyway, later that night, Mike planned to meet with Denise to go out for their sixth wedding anniversary. So he's going duck hunting. Later, he'll go to work. Then later that night, big party, sixth anniversary wedding of his wedding. Now, Mike wasn't going alone duck hunting. He was going with his best mate, Brian. No one else knew Brian was going, only Denise and Brian. They would meet at a gas station not far from the place they'd go hunting. Brian had his phone off the whole time. Everybody knows why. Doesn't want to be tracked there. Brian also insisted that they get their waiters on now at the servo so as not to waste time. Mike agreed and they both put their waiters on. Instead of both getting in one truck to go to the lake, Brian insisted they take both their cars. When they got to the lake, they put the small, what they called a genoo, little genoo boat into the water. It's like a canoe with a flat bit at the back where you can put an engine. They got in with their guns and started out from the shore. Now, as I said before, if you're wearing waders close to shore in shallow water, that's fine. That's what they're for. However, if you go into deeper water... These waders can become deadly if you fall in as they will rapidly fill up with water and they can sink you to the bottom. So Brian was at the back of the boat controlling the motor while Mike was up the front. Brian steered the boat out from the shore into deeper water. He then somehow gets Mike to stand up, maybe to swap so Mike can steer the boat or whatever. Anyway, when Mike stands up, Brian pushes him over the side. Now, Mike must have been so confused at the moment as he thrashed around in the water, his waders rapidly filling with water. As he screamed for help, Brian moved the boat out of his reach and watched as his friends desperately struggled to keep afloat. Mike was able to get his jacket off and then frantically tried to get the waders off that were now pulling him under. Brian looked on. Then instead of Mike sinking under the water, His waders came off and he was able to cling to a submerged branch of a tree. Lake Seminole isn't a natural lake, as I said. It's dammed off. There used to be an orchard and forest where the water now covers covers it and it's littered with submerged tree trunks. As Mike clung onto the tree trunk, what what he must have been thinking. Both men were now in a panic. Now, as you can imagine what Brian was thinking. He must have been thinking, now this is awkward. This isn't how I planned it to go. He and Mike stared at each other in the darkness. 
In the boat with Brian is not only his shotgun, but Mike's as well. Brian started to circle Mike, still clinging onto the tree. As he circled, he got closer and closer to Mike. Eventually, he raised the shotgun, pointed it at Mike and shot him in the head. Mike sunk under the water. Brian knew he couldn't leave him there with a gunshot to the head. So Brian grabbed Mike's lifeless body and motored the boat towards the shore not far from where they had left originally. Once on shore, he backed up his truck, lifted Mike's body into the back and pushed the boat out into the water. At this stage, there was no way Brian could meet up with his father as planned for his alibi and he also had to dispose of a body now and clean up his truck. He raced back home, freaking out and trying to work out what to do. At one stage, while waiting at a red light, a state trooper pulled up next to him. I bet you he was wondering if God's will was going to intervene, but no. And he continued back to his house with Mike's body in the back. He then crept into the house, hoping his wife was still asleep, and she was. He got in next to her, did a bit of spooning, and woke her just enough to tell her he was going out and he'd slept in, and what now wasn't going out to see his father as planned. Brian then called his father-in-law and apologised for sleeping in, and then that he wasn't going to meet him. Brian then got out of bed and went back outside to his truck. There he noticed blood dripping out the back of the tray. I mean, fuck, nothing's going right. He had to clean that up and decide where to hide Mike's body. He knew of a place near Car Lake, but had no tools to do the job. So he went to Walmart, bought a shovel, a tarp and fitness weights. I mean, that's not suspect at all. Here he would meet a friend of his and Mike's, also called Mike. I mean, when you're buying murder kit stuff, you don't want to be running into people you know. Brian and Denise's plan was really falling apart at this stage. So Brian takes off with Mike's body in the back to bury him near the end of Gardner's Road at Carr Lake. The road stops at a dead end. It's just a dirt road and it's surrounded by bush. Brian gets out of the truck, puts down the tarp and drags Mike's body out of the truck and onto the tarp. He realises that he's too heavy to take a long distance, which he was going to, into the lake, which at this time of the year, it had a low water level. He decides to take him a short distance off the road and when he finds a spot, he starts digging. He then hears a car approaching. I mean, fuck's sake. He makes sure Mike's body is hidden as best he could and then goes back up to his truck. He chats with the driver who's there to uh, hunt deer. I mean, fuck, you can imagine this. Mike was just supposed to drown. Why don't you just drown? Well, once the hunter is far enough away... Brian continues to dig a grave for his best mate, Mike. Once he's buried, Brian still has the problem of cleaning out all the blood from his truck and he's supposed to be going to an early Christmas dinner with the family that night. Now, at this stage, Denise has no fucking idea what's happened as she calls around friends and family asking if they've seen Mike as he hadn't returned from his hunting trip. Remember, Brian had his phone off to disguise his location and was busy freaking out and burying the body. She also calls police and reports him missing. First, Brian goes to his parents' house. This is to clean the truck and tries to lose, use a hose to clean out all the blood, but that doesn't work that well. So he tries to find a car wash with a pressure washer. Now he finds one, but it's on the other side of town. So it's just up the road. He's got to go for miles. Now, this does a better job, but now he has to go meet up for the Christmas meal, unaware that people are now starting to go to Lake Seminole to search for Mike. Brian goes to the Christmas party with his family, and then on the way home, his father calls him to tell tell him Mike's missing from a duck hunting trip, and that he needs to come and help look for him. Brian meets with his father, and they go to the lake where several of Mike's friends are already searching near where his truck was found. Brian and his father take a boat out to search and as it got later and most people had stopped for the day, Brian's father refused to give up. You see, Brian's father loved Mike, thought he was a good bloke. A storm was approaching as they spotted Mike's boat. They didn't touch it and there was no sign of Mike. So they returned to the shore, 
told police of what they'd found just as a huge storm came over the area. So for the next couple of months, police continued to search the area with help from family and friends, but still no sign of Mike. Now, out of 80-odd deaths in the lake, this was the first time that the body or body parts had not been found. It started to look like an alligator maybe had eaten Mike after he'd fallen out of his boat. Now, one of the searches, Brian took a hat exactly like Mike. So Brian's going out on searches all the time, you know, with his dad and everybody else. So he buys a hat exactly like Mike's and drops it in the water so someone could find it. And this would give weight to the theory that Mike had drowned and had been eaten or whatever. You see, Denise needed some sort of evidence that Mike had met his end in the lake so she could claim on the insurance. The hat was found, and then his jacket, his hunting license, and then the waders. The problem is, all this looked in pretty good condition, not like it had been at the bottom of a lake for months. Also, nothing had signs that an alligator had attacked Mike, plus... Alligators at that time of year sort of go into a hibernation state because it's cold and they don't eat. Cheryl, Mike's mum, smelt a rat. In February 2001, search efforts are wound down and a memorial is held for Mike. Now, Denise was able to go to court, this is with Brian's dad's help, to get Mike declared dead so she could claim on his insurance because she was complaining she had no money. This was only six months after he went missing, whereas the normal waiting time to declare someone dead is several years. Now, Cheryl doesn't let things go, like a good mum. She knows things don't add up and constantly calls the investigators, asking them to keep on the case. Denise, at this stage, still lets Cheryl access to her granddaughter, but soon she would cut this off. Brian and Denise still need to not be seen together, so they only rarely meet up, and it won't be it won't be until two thousand and five that they get married. Instead, Brian and Kathy would invite Denise out. So Brian and Kathy are married. They just invite Denise out. That way, they got to be together without suspicion. Now, Kathy wasn't stupid. She described feeling like the third wheel on these occasions. Well, as time goes on, as I said, Brian divorces his wife and marries Denise. This raises a few eyebrows and pisses off Mike's family, as this Brian guy is now shacked up in Mike's house that he works so hard for, and Denise was rolling in money from the insurance, not to mention that access to the granddaughter had been cut from early on. Denise also was just not interested in helping to find Mike's body, either searching or or helping with some of the insurance money to do an investigation, or whatever. Brian and Denise also being married meant they wouldn't have to testify against each other. Still, Cheryl, Mike's loving mum, kept up the pressure on law enforcement, just like, if you remember, Columbo would. By 2006, after Cheryl publishes a quarter-page ad for a missing son, the newspaper, the Tallahassee Democrat, starts to investigate the story and police finally state that his disappearance is suspicious. The reporter, Jennifer Portman, researches the case and writes a yearly column marking the anniversary of Mike's disappearance. In 2007, Lake Seminole is again searched with better equipment because there's still no trace of Mike's body. In 2008, there's an investigation into the life insurance policies but there's still no evidence that can help in Mike's disappearance. By this time, Brian and Denise still have this hanging over their heads. They can't relax for a moment, but their relationship starts to fall apart. Eventually, Denise is having an affair with a guy called Chuck, and Brian is rooting someone at his work called Angela. When Brian finds out about Chuck, he's pissed off. And when Denise finds out about Angela, she's pissed off. What's the, what the fuck is wrong with these people? In 2011, Investigation Discovery airs an episode on Mike's disappearance, which renews, renews public interest in the case. And in 2012, Brian and Denise separate. In August of 2015, 
Denise files for divorce, but this doesn't sit well with Brian. Financially, he will come out of this fucked up as Denise keeps all the money in the house after he was the one that killed the husband. Brian starts to lose it, and a year later, in August 2016, he kidnaps Denise at gunpoint in her car. He's arrested, and then Denise pleads with the judge to remand him in custody as she believes that her and her child are in danger if he's let out on bail. Now, I was going to play you a statement from the court, from Denise. Look, I couldn't find a raw copy that I could use. Only one from an investigation show which had their music in the background, so it wasn't really appropriate just to steal that. Now, if you can imagine the look on Brian's face as he appears on the video screen in the court hearing... While Denise is putting shit on him to keep him away, it's just priceless. She's trying to put him away and you can see by his expression that everything she says is not only a lie, but he's plotting revenge. You can just see it in his face. Oh my God. Now, just try and search for this case on video. You'll find it. You'll know exactly what I mean. Now, Denise is really pushing the one guy that could put her away for life. What a bitch. While waiting for his trial for kidnapping, they're divorced in May 2017. On December the 19th, 2017, Brian's found guilty of the armed kidnapping of Denise and is sentenced to 20 years under a plea deal. Oh, what's all that about, you say? Brian knew that Denise could probably twist the truth and tell investigators her version of what happened to Mike, so he got in first. The next day, the 20th of December 2017, Mike's remains are found, but police refuse to give any details as they further investigate. So, I reckon (laughs) Denise's little ring hole tighten up a little bit on that news, like, oh my god, they found his body. A day after I put Brian away. By May the 8th, 2018, Denise Williams was arrested at her workplace at the Florida State University on charges of first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit first-degree murder, and accessory after the fact in the killing of her husband, Mike Williams. She would also later be charged with insurance fraud. Denise was found guilty and sentenced to the mandatory charge of uh, charge of life in prison without the possibility of parole for her role in Mike's murder. She re- received an additional 30 years in prison for conspiring to kill him. Cheryl, Mike's courageous mum who never gave up on him, asked Leon Circuit Judge James Hankinson to order her locked up for the rest of her life. And, oh, yeah, I reckon she... Deserved it 100%. Well, at least she was finally able to bury her son and get justice, even if it took two decades. Now, as a now, as a bonus, I will release the audio of Brian testifying against Denise at her trial. I'll do this in a couple of days. I'll cut it up and I'll. It's about an hour or so. It's great listening, and it also brings out the emotion of Brian, because you can really tell, well, there's a lot of regret in it, whether or not the remorse, look, if he had real remorse after he did it, after a few days, he would have just said, hey, it was me. But we're talking 12 years later, he's sort of stuck in this situation where he decides to confess. So I wouldn't say it's so much remorse, but there's so much regret, and especially the bit when he talks about his father, he's going out with his father to try and find Mike. It really breaks him up. So, you know, he, well, he deserves everything he gets. So, anyway, Islanders, that's the ultimate betrayal. That really, was it really worth it in the end? I mean, at, at all. Mike worked hard for his family, but not only for his wife, but his best friend conspired not only to take all that from him, but they indulged themselves in the ultimate betrayal. They took his life. So they were rooting each other, but they had to kill him. But the karma bus was ready to do the boom vagalunga on that couple. Now, how was the actual murder, hey? How a simple push over the side and hope he drowns turned out into a drawn out bloody affair. Everything that could go wrong did go wrong. 
it really shows that if you're going to do something like this, you need to have a, some sort of backup plan. And maybe it was God's plan, the way it handled, that it all worked out. So, you know, God's will. <laughs> so that's the end of another case. And I hope it was, well, it's really sad. I mean, it's awful. You can't really laugh about this. It's, it's just bad. But you got to laugh at this couple of idiots, what they did. I mean, they would never have enjoyed any moment after that day. They just weren't able to be together because it looked sus. When they did get together, they stayed together for a few years and then they end up rooting other people, getting upset about that. In the end, they get busted and they're going to spend the rest of their fucking life in jail, which is good. So that's the end of another case. At this time, of course, we've got the Patreon and PayPal shout-outs. Now, I think I've got them all. So thanks to Lizzie. Thanks to Sarah Quick. Thanks to Linda Hall-Martin. Kelly Alicia. Gemma and Astley. And also on PayPal, there was an Eric Westrich. Thank you all so much. And thanks to all the past and present Patreon and PayPal donators. Thank you so much. True Crime Island, as you know, is a totally ad-free, listener-supported podcast because at the moment, I can't find any other way to finance the island without pesky ads. Look, I would advertise, but I'd have to advertise something I truly believe in or use so that cuts out most things unless Ford want to sling me a new Mustang to drive around town or Chang Beer want to fill my fridge with beer, you know, all the time. So, you know, we'll see what happens. Anyway, if you want to support the island financially, go to patreon.com forward slash true crime island and sign up. And for a one-off donation, you can go to paypal.me forward slash true crime island. You can go to my shop and buy merch. That's truecrimeisland.threadless.com where you can get mugs, tote bags and, of course, T-shirts, hoodies and the like. Now, there are some stickers on there, different size ones. They're not the stickers I send out, but they're similar. But they're, you can get big ones, small ones, all that sort of stuff if you just want to add one to your T-shirt or whatever order you've got. Now, speaking of stickers, I have new ones on order, which I'll be sending out to Patreon reward qualifiers. And to Lewis, hi Lewis, who ordered some from me today. In fact, look, I did find a few left from the Melbourne meetup, so I'll be posting some this week before the new ones arrive. Reminding me of the meetup on May the 19th in Newtown, Sydney, somewhere, we're going to have a meetup with some of the people from the Podcast Awards. There's going to be Bloody Murder, Evidence Locker, there's going to be me there. There could be a few other things. So look on Facebook or Twitter. There will be an announcement. I will have an announcement last uh, next week, just before it all happens, so you get a week's notice. Not sure exactly where it's going to be, but it'll be in Newtown somewhere on Sunday lunchtime sometime. So if you want beer, koozies, stickers, lapel pins, or key change, you can email me directly, cambo at True Crime Island. That's for anything you want to tell me. It's the easiest, best way to get me sort of thing. Now, the stickers, like I said, on the Threadless shop are there as an alternative. You can get the bigger ones. You can just add it to an order that you're already getting rather than me sending them all the way from Sydney. You can also promote the island by rating and reviewing and telling your friends, family and co-workers. If they don't know what you're on about, show them the wide world of podcasting. They will love you for it as there's so many shows out there. And one show I will run a promo for tonight is the Going West podcast. Hosted weekly by Heath and Daphne. They delve into missing people, murders and all that true crime sort of stuff. So check them out. Now, I have been a little slack on the social media since I got back from holidays. I really need a holiday to get over the holiday. But you can hook up on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Just search for True Crime Island and join the closed Facebook group. That's what it is, page or group, whatever. So that's about it, I think. So lots of love to Maggie James. I'm your host, Cambo. You've been listening to True Crime Island. As I always say, don't forget to delete your browser history. Good night and boom vagalanga.
What's going on, true crime fans? I'm your host, Heath. And I'm your other host, Daphne. And we're from Going West. A true crime podcast where we discuss various murders, disappearances, and unsolved crimes. We release new episodes every Monday, and each week we have a different case to dive into. You can find us over on Instagram at Going West Podcast. And on Twitter at Going West Pod. Listen to some of our episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also find us over on Patreon, patreon.com slash goingwestpodcast, where you can get exclusive bonus ad-free episodes every month. If you're looking for a new true crime binge, check out Going West. For everybody out there in the world, keep it real and stay weird. Cheerio. Cheerio.